This week on The Gadget Show, why black box data recorders are almost indestructible and how much punishment can our own data storage take. Also, John tests noise-cancelling headphones by flying to Monaco. Tonight, we're testing to destruction again, this time to see which type of computer memory can withstand all of this. To begin with, we thought we'd look at the ultimate example of indestructible technology. It comes from a highly classified industry, but the gadget show has been given privileged access. I'm talking about this, a flight data recorder, otherwise known as an aeroplane's black box. It records 25 hours worth of data, like engine power and altitude, while cockpit microphones feed in what the pilots are saying and even the sound of clicking switches. If the worst happens, then the hunt immediately begins to recover the black box from the wreckage, which could be spread over hundreds of miles. The data inside is used to paint a picture about the aircraft's last moments. Black box construction is highly specialised. Only a handful of companies and just two in Britain have risen to the challenge of designing something that has to endure the most stringent testing procedures in the world. This manufacturer's footage shows first the penetration test, where a 500 pound steel spike is dropped on the box from 10 feet. If the casing is too thin, the spike goes clean through like a hole punch, but make the casing just a fraction thicker and the spike bounces off. Then the black box has to endure a 5,000 pound crush test in a hydraulic press. If it flinches, it fails. But the harshest test is having to endure 1,100 degrees centigrade for one hour, then 260 degrees centigrade for 10 hours. Now you know why they're called black boxes. But no matter how charred the exterior, the recorded information inside must be kept pristine. This steel casing isn't actually meant to be indestructible. It's only the precious data inside that needs protecting. So within this is the titanium crash box, which in turn encases the memory chips. To help deflect those heavy impacts, the crash box is cylindrical. To withstand what could be 20 tonnes of blazing jet fuel, a heat-resistant packing is used, similar to the material found in fire safes. And to protect against crashing into the sea, the chips are covered in a microscopic layer of varnish. Then, by law, the box must have one-inch high lettering in English and French and has to be painted International Orange Tint 594. An emergency beacon that will last 30 days is then fitted and the whole thing is mounted at the back of the plane, i.e. behind the crumple zone. When you found your black box, retrieving the information is designed to be as simple as possible. There's just one socket and you just plug in this universal adapter and your computer will automatically show you the data that you need to download. So if we just click on channel one, okay, there you go. It's as simple as that, it just takes seconds. So, what's next for black boxes? Well, unlike everything else, miniaturization is not on the cards. This is about as small as they'll get. Any smaller, and they'd be even harder to find. They're certainly tough enough so it seems the next development will be to add in cameras so that you can see and not just hear what the pilots were doing. For the smart Alex out there who are wondering why, if you can protect the contents of a black box, can't they build a plane in the same way? Well, if they did, it'd be so heavy, it wouldn't be able to get off the ground. So what's the closest thing to a black box you can buy on the high street? Join us later to find out where exactly your data is safest. This is Tom Dunmore, gadget guru and editor of Rip and Burn magazine. He's here to tell us what's new in the world of mobile phones. 
It's only been six months since I last did a roundup of phones on the Gadget Show, but really everything's changed. There's been such a leap forward in, in that time. We've seen the first megapixel phones, there's been lots of 3G phones, and the rise also of phones like this, real fashion accessories. Uh, this one from Nokia uh, it looks more like a, a lipstick or something than a mobile phone, but you slide it open, you realise it is a phone. It's got a display under the mirror, it's got a camera, it's all voice activated but frankly, I think it looks a little bit too girly for me. If you want something a little bit more manly, how about the 7710 from Nokia? This is their latest media terminal phone. As you can see, it's got this massive touch screen. This is great for accessing videos, for looking at Word documents, so it will store lots of MP3 files, and it's got a radio too. This one will actually have a digital TV adapter coming out too, so you'll be able to watch TV on the screen. It's very impressive, but the one problem is that it's 2.5G or GPRS rather than 3G, so it's not as fast for internet browsing as it really should be. If you're after a 3G phone, this is the one to go for. This is the Sony Ericsson V800, and it's an awesome phone. I can't tell you how good it is. It looks just like a normal old-style phone. It's not the sort of bricks we've come to expect from 3G, but it does all the tricks. It's got video calling on it, and crucially, it's also got music downloads direct to the phone. This is a Vodafone service. It's £1.50 for each song, and the sound quality is great. You can access them anywhere, and thanks to a removable memory stick, you can keep as many as you like. So this really could be the next iPod, this phone. It's, it's awesome. And if that's still not gadgety enough for you, how about this? This is the first iPack mobile phone. It's essentially a cut-down PC. It runs Windows, so you can get the full sort of browsing, email experience, use all your office documents on it. It's really very impressive. It's even got Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, as well as a mobile phone built in. However, all that functionality comes at a bit of a cost, and it's not just financial. The battery doesn't last that long. And because it's a PC, it takes a while to start up, and it is prone to crashing. So in six months' time, uh, what will we see? More fashion phones or more power phones? I hope it's somewhere between the two. The world makes one hell of a racket. Annoying noise undoubtedly causes stress, and a recent German study suggests that it can even trigger a heart attack. Luckily, technology may have a solution. Noise-cancelling headphones. We've got four sets here, all promising you a quieter life. And one place they should be really useful is on a plane, where you're exposed to lots of noise for hours at a time. Trouble is, when you try these things out in the shops, you don't have a plane to hand. But fortunately, for our tests, we do. Three out of the four headphones work by analysing ambient noise and generating another sound that mirrors the noise to help cancel it out, all while you're listening to your music. That's the theory, but how will the headphones cope with the constant throb of an aeroplane's engines? I'll be wearing a special microphone in my ear so you can hear the difference too. First up, the cheapest. These Sonys are about £80. You uh, unfold them, slight exercise in origami, and uh, check you've got them the right way around. They're quite a light, comfortable fit. They sort of fit on the ears rather than surround them. Um, let's switch the noise reduction on. And uh, you still get quite a lot of noise, actually, even with it on. But there is a change in the character of the sound. It sort of cuts out the bass notes a bit. This is off. This is on. Uh, let's try some music. I don't know whether you can hear, but with them off, you can hardly hear the music at all. And uh, even, even with them on, it's a bit dodgy in some of the quiet passages, so I don't think um, I'll be buying one of these. Next up, for £100, these Sennheisers. Like the Sony, they fold. Unlike the Sony, they come with an extra box with all the electronics in. Uh, possibly slightly more noise deadening effect. Let's put the electronics on. There's a sort of gassy texture to the sound. It's almost as though you're going under general anaesthetic. Let's 
let's try it with some music. And again, you have to turn the volume right up to full. So if you jolt the box, it uh, clicks and rattles, which isn't very good. Significantly better than the Sony's, but not quite the degree of noise reduction I was hoping for. If you do require any further details, please don't hesitate to contact a member of your cabin crew. Now for the biggest case and the biggest price tag, £275 for the Bose acoustic noise cancelling headphones. Let's unwrap them. Right, immediately they have a sort of feel-good factor. They're made of rather pleasant rubbery materials. You uh, pop them on. And immediately they have a much more significant noise reducing effect on their own before you switch on the electronics because they seal much better round the ears. You can switch them on. Mm. It's almost as though the noise is sort of sucked away. It's actually quite a nice sensation. They immediately feel much better than the other two. Um, let's try plugging them in and listening to the music. I certainly think it's the best of the three so far, but there is another way of getting noise cancellation. Let's try that next. Shaw's sound isolating earphones cost £175 and have no electronics. They act more like earplugs. They come with a whole variety of attachments, but these foam ones seem to me to be the most effective. To try them out, I'll have to remove my uh, microphone, unfortunately, and then what you do is you scrunch the foam up like you would an earplug, squeeze it into your ear quite hard, hold it there for about 10 seconds and the foam expands and forms a sound tight seal, we hope, which will eliminate more noise than the other method. That's half of it. Wait for the other one. First impressions, this seems much better than the other method. It not only cuts down the noise of the engine, but the noise of everyone chattering the cabin as well. Let's try the, uh, let's try it with the music. Wow. It was just as if the music was being injected into my ears. And what's more, I only needed half volume. When we landed in Nice, we thought we'd put them to an even tougher test. So paid up 70 euros and took the helicopter taxi to Monaco. Helicopter pilots use specially uprated noise-reducing headsets worth £500. If the Shaw earphones worked in a hostile oral environment like this, they'd work anywhere. This must be one of the noisiest forms of public transport there is, but even here, I can hear the music loudly and clearly, and I'll be arriving at Monaco in my own calm, quiet and relaxed world. At 900 miles, Luton to Monaco is admittedly one of life's more extreme commutes. But no matter how long your journey, I'd recommend these Shaw earphones wholeheartedly. And now, as promised, it's time for some extreme testing to find out just where your data is safest. What's the closest you can get to your own personal black box? The contenders are the old school floppy disk, a compact disk, a DVD, a USB memory stick, a multimedia card, and a state of the art 90 gig removable hard drive. The data each device will carry throughout our tests is a photograph of itself, and every now and then we'll be dragging the photo off each device to make sure we can still see it. To begin with, we've decided to cook our chips. And to that end, I'm baking a pie. So my pastry rim is all ready to go. Next up, my filling. Just dollop a generous portion of that in there. Oh. Add some sweet corn, a little bit of tuna. And then in go all our memory devices. And that's about it. I've now got to put on my pastry lid, and then we're ready for baking. Or should I say, roasting. The temperatures here are well above anything that the manufacturers reckon their products will endure. We're using propane gas, and that can burn at almost 2,000 degrees Celsius. Ah, that's what you call 
memory pie brulee. All I've got to do now is take out the devices and test them. But before that, I'll need to cool this pie down quickly. This apparatus holds blocks of frozen carbon dioxide, which are stored at minus 80 degrees Celsius. The air temperature is a mere minus 2 degrees Celsius, so when I release the carbon dioxide, it understandably warms up a bit and turns to gas. It stays cold for long enough, however, to give our pie a severe case of frostbite. With the pie now cooler, it's time to get our devices out and wash them. And to rinse them off, the next of my culinary creations, a punch of all the liquids that your devices might accidentally come into contact with. We'll start off with cola. I've slotted this stuff on several bits of my kit. Nice, generous helping. Look at that, beautiful. OK, next up, we could have gone for wine, but instead we've gone for the more acidy vinegar. Plenty of vinegar in there. Oh, splendid. And if there's one liquid that you want to make sure your devices never get anywhere near, it's salt water. So, plenty of salt in there too. Go. Beautiful. OK, I think that's just about ready. A quick stir. And all I've got to do now is retrieve my devices from the pie. Oh. None of our test items are waterproof, but all contain some metal parts, and that can mean corrosion. The corrosion takes place as the metal reacts with the oxygen in the liquids. Salt or sodium chloride accelerates this process, as do high levels of acidity, as are found in cola and vinegar. Having rinsed and dried our devices, it's time to see if the digital photos stored on them have survived. I'll start off by testing the floppy disk. I haven't got very high hopes for this because even now there's moisture seeping from its pores. Also, the spring mechanism has come off in the pie, which doesn't bode well. That doesn't sound healthy at all. Nevertheless, I'm still going to try and access it. Go on! Whatever I tried, it was hopeless. Poor little floppy disk, I think it's bit in the dust. One down, <laughs> several more to go. Next up, the compact disc. Remember, each device holds a photograph of itself, and that's what we want to see. Yes! Success breeds success, and despite having water trapped between its layers, the DVD worked easily. It's clear. As did the multimedia card. Fantastic. And the USB memory stick. Fantastic. All that was left was the most expensive and most complex of our gadgets, the 150 pound removable hard drive. Can you hear that? It's making some weird gravelly noise. Doesn't sound right at all. It's sort of struggling to open. Try again. Having taken it out and given it a bit of a clean. See, there's loads of gunk in there. I tried again and. Get that light. Uh... Oh, hang on. It might have worked. Yes! That's fantastic. It, it took about five minutes and a, a couple of little impromptu cleaning sessions, but it's actually worked. That's fantastic. So amazingly, all but the floppy were still working. Time to get more brutal then. Slowly, that's it. Next up, we wanted to test right just how much pressure our survivors Perfect. could take. Bring and so off. we ran them over. Very slight to the left. To in the a left. Land Rover. Good, good. Twice. Oh, ah! Oh. Good work, Graham. Let's go and check. Well, I guess that's the pressure test done. Now to give them some impact. What we're trying to simulate is the kind of impact you get when you drop one of these devices or slip and accidentally chuck it across a road. But we've gone for a more extreme version. This is a wall. And just a few feet away, a device called a pan mortar. Inside is some very serious explosives. I'm going to shove all of my memory devices in there. And then this mortar is going to fire them against the wall. Should be fun. Wow. 
Well, it certainly makes good telly. But I think we might have overdone the explosives just a bit. <laughs> for a good couple of hours, the whole team searched for our devices. The DVD and CD had disintegrated completely. The hard disk had shattered, leaving just a twisted case, as had the memory card. We did find the innards of our USB memory stick, but just look at it. Surely no data could have survived that. Or could it? This is on-track data recovery, and they specialize in retrieving vital data from damaged storage media. And astoundingly, they seemed hopeful of getting something out of our USB stick. After hours of work, nothing. But these guys weren't going to give up that easily. After a lot more work, some replaced components, and a few clever tricks which we're not allowed to reveal, they tried plugging it in again. And there was our photo. Amazingly, after being cooked, frozen, corroded, driven over, and fired into a wall at point-blank range, this little stick was still doing its job. A fact that may seem a little less surprising when I tell you it uses exactly the same type of solid-state memory storage as its all-conquering big brother, the black box. Even when you log off, the virtual world continues expanding and developing thanks to the efforts of thousands of other games. Oculus Rift is the most famous system, having been bought by Facebook for $2 billion in 2012. 